Um, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what I will shortly summarize here is the nature of irregular warfare during the Armenian genocide in World War I. This ties to a certain extent in with the previous and other uh, lectures as it gives you a more systematic perspective that these um, strategies and these ideologies are not very new, but have a, a long wave throughout the 20th century. The Ottoman state, like other states, used irregulars throughout its medieval and early modern period as a kind of advance force which would soften enemy strongholds in the Balkans. These were called Akinjis. These were people who were not paid by the Ottoman government. They could get some weapons. And usually these were elements of Ottoman society you don't want to have as your neighbor. So it was a way of cleaning out a social problem and transferring it to the neighbors and profit from it. Of course, the Ottoman state became modern. It established a modern army. And unlike European states, where you had the same process, the Ottomans maintained the irregulars. At that time, they were called the Bashibuzuks, the crazy people. And they became especially famous in the 1870s during the Bulgarian horrors. That pointed already to a deployment of these forces against civilians, which has a twofold advantage for a government. First, you maintain plausible deniability. It wasn't our army. These were people enraged. They got out of hand. And secondly, you kept the Im uh, imagination of a clean army that w wouldn't do such things. And the honor of the officer corps, which would not be involved in such things. Uh, you kept this imagination intact. These were, of course, crimes during an imp uh, imperial system, the Ottoman Empire. By the early 20th century, the situation changes profoundly. In the last days of sultanic rule, in things in Macedonia, Macedonia, that is in the Balkans again, turned very complicated for the Ottoman rulers, as Bulgarians, Greeks, and to a lesser extent, Serbs, rebelled against Ottoman rule and tried to carve out territory from the Ottoman provinces in Macedonia. In response, the Ottoman government created special units. These were Avge Tabula. We can uh, roughly translate these as rangers. These were highly mobile units who were going after the enemy and not to subdue him, but to annihilate him. No prisoners taken. Very important for us is to understand that the officers in these units, the commanders, were highly motivated Turkish nationalists. So these were no longer the officers of the empire. These were, in their own views, the officers of a new Turkish identity of the Turkish nation, and they formed the Committee of Union and Progress, which successfully in 1908 over through the old order. After the success of the revolution in 1908, these officers spread out. Some of the officers had formed earlier the Fidai. These were the people, officers, who were willing to sacrifice their life for the course. 
in a more modern term, we would say these were the hitmen. That's, that means the assassins of the COP, which were deployed when high value target had to be killed. These officers become after 1908, something else. They enter the civil service. In 1915, the head of the Minister of Interior's Directorate for Public Security, that's basically the state security apparatus, was run by a murderer, Ismail Janbulat Bey, one of these officers. Other officers like Aintab Le Abdul Kadir Bey had be uh, became in 1915 governors. The man was a convicted murderer and was known. So what you see here is that this cadre of cold-blooded murderers, panteronists, fanatics, slowly spread from the army into the civil administration and other forms. They also, let me just move a little bit here. They also um, established the so-called special organization, the Teshkilata Masusa. This was a kind of expansion of the special highly mobile units. And they hoped that with this kind of warfare, highly motivated people could bring about results the regular army couldn't. For these units, they recruited ethnic minorities, especially from the Caucasus, qualified killers, that means convicts, which were released for the purpose from, the, uh, from prison, and basically anybody who would fit the bill. This included also Kurdish tribes. When it came then to World War I, this Teshkilata Masusa started operations not at the end of October 1914, that is the entry of the Ottoman Empire into World War I. They started earlier in August. So they started an irregular secret undercover warfare and the officers we know from Macedonia were in the first line with these people. They augmented their numbers with Kurdish tribes and they attacked not just Russia, more importantly, they attacked Persia, Iran. And it was in that area on the Persian front that these groups committed the first massacres. This was a kind of warfare to not occupy territory alone, but also to cleanse the territory and eradicate unwanted population, Armenians and Assyrians, but also Shia Muslims if they were not on the payroll. These units were, however, no match for regular Russian uh, units. It turned out very quickly on the Iranian front and on the Georgian front that the moment these units faced regularly, regular uh, Russian troops, they would run. So they had no chance in combat, which that in combat against regular units, which led in the early 1915, in April, to their dissolution. These units were then called into the regular frontline troops after the defeat of Sarakamish. But the leaders of these units, these highly motivated officers, these young Turks, became then the organizers of the massacres of Armenians during the Armenian Genocide. Having lost their former combat units to the army, they went behind the line and started recruiting locally Kurds, Muslims, whoever would fit, 
especially butchers, literally butchers from the market they took because these people knew how to cut a head off. These people of the so-called Teshkilata Masusa walked around in, in uniforms of the Ottoman Red Crescent, Red Cross. They were activists of the Turk, first Turkish NGO, the Turkish Turk Ojaklare, the Turkish Hearts. So what you have here is also the merger of non-government organizations within this group. Other killer squads were taken from the militia. The Ottomans had a militia called up. They had a tribal cavalry. Tribal cavalry could be under Teshkilata Masusa commander or under their Kurdish tribal chief. They had a variety of these people and basically what they combined war, what combined them was that there were killer squads and the Armenian deportees understood that they called them with one single word, chete. That means bandits, killer squads. So when we talk about Teshkilata Masusa, formally it was only a part of the killing squads, but all these killing squads had the same kind of characteristics while differing a little bit in the command structure. In 1916, in 1916, in the Syrian desert, the killing, the killers of the Armenians of the Azor, one of the largest massacres, or maybe the largest massacres at the Khabur River and near Russell Ain, were Chechens. These were specifically recruited and it were less Arabs and hardly any gendarmes. It was Chechens. Now, what does this mean for the um, Caucasus? The organizer of the Deazor massacres under the uh, leadership of Talat and Ismail Jambulat Bey, Ismail Jambulat Bey, this Fedai, was directly giving orders for Deazor massacres, was Zeki Bey. Zeki Bey became the founder of the Turkish Communist Party and he was dispatched to the Caucasus in 1918. Fuat Sabit, the organizer of the Kemach massacres and one of the heads of the Turkish Hearts, was first dis dispatched to Iran, Persia, and then to the Caucasus. The commander of the Iranian adventure, later commander of the 6th Ottoman army in Iraq, who was also implicated in the Deazor massacre, Halil Kut, was sent to the Caucasus. The other major killer of Kemach, Ebu Hintli Jaffa Efendi from Erzurum, was dispatched to the Caucasus. The chief killer of Diyabaka province, Cherkes, Dr. Cherkes Reshid Bey, fell uh, for some time because of corruption in disfavor. In 1918, he was sent to the Caucasus. The butcher of Bitlis and later governor of Aleppo was sent in 1918 to Batumi, Ardahan, Kars to organize the Turkish state. Ahmed Agayev, one of the chief ideologues of the COP, an Azeri or Tatar, was sent to the Caucasus. So what you have here is basically, in 1918, the COP deployed its experts for mass murder, its proven operatives, to the Caucasus. So what you see here is that once the war in, on the Arabian front had been lost, they used these people to further the, their program 
after the Russian Revolution in 1917, 1918, 1919 in the Caucasus. And that is basically the export of genocidal cadres to a new field of operation. And we will see these people, that is today not our topic, during the massacres of Baku, during the massacres of Katharinenfeld, and during the operations against the Republic of Armenia. So this irregular warfare established in Macedonia continued through the World War I, was sent over to um, the Caucasus, and of course, the Ottoman government signed a ceasefire. It was defeated, but these people continued, and you had again the element of plausible deniability, like before. Thank you very much.